Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. Today, I'm joined by an artist who got lessons in cooking from all sides of his family growing up. Whether it was his grandmother making biscuits every morning from scratch, or his grandfather's dedication to barbecue. Not only did he cook old school, like on a pit, burning your own coals, and just kind of doing it the old school way, but he also upped it and started building these big grills out of big old oil tanks. He would do all the welding, every nut, every bolt. He literally figured out how big he needed every hole for the gas burners. You know, so that was a big part, the barbecue and stuff like that growing up. Lee Bryce was born and raised in Sumter, South Carolina, and had equal passions for sports and songwriting while attending Clemson University. When an injury officially sidelined his football career, he set his sights on Nashville in 2001 and slowly made a name for himself in Music City. With multiple ACM awards under his belt, he released his most recent album, Hey World, last year. On the stirring title track, a duet with vocalist Blessing Offer, Lee speaks for a lot of us looking for a break from it all. Hey world, leave me alone. I don't want to turn on the TV Ain't nothing but bad news on Yeah, the rain can wait For another day And this heart's worn out It's had all it can take Hey, world, leave me alone On today's show... Lee explains how one of his aunts influenced his obsession with music and how there's still a little sibling rivalry in the family when it comes to singing. Annie Henry is the kind of the root of the music that everybody, even the sisters, all kind of sit there and wait on her to play, and then they, she'll even direct them to this day. No, 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 now, Lori, you're flat. Now, you need to sit, get them. Get you know what I mean? Like, it's so funny to watch them sing these songs because they still... They still act like sisters, like to this day, and Henry will call them out. It's funny. Plus his dad's sausage perlo and much more today on Biscuits and Jam. How you doing, Lee? Well, I'm good. I actually uh, I just kind of signed a new publishing deal and I had a meeting with them in person for the first time. And over here at my barn, actually, if you, you could see, we're on Zoom, and so I'm in my yeah. my barn slash man cave slash hunting lodge slash kitchen. <laughs> so the, I, we had a meeting here instead of going somewhere else, and I actually decided to uh, to try for the first time myself to cook some from scratch biscuits because I do these elk sausage egg, egg biscuits that I've been trying to do, but I've always done the like pre-made biscuits, so this morning I... Got out the flour and the the oil and the buttermilk and made my own biscuits and so it was it was a fun venture this one. I've been up since six cooking. <laughs> well, how'd that go? How'd they come out? It was good. They were a little bit crumbly, but they but so I I told everybody I was like, look these are these are made these are biscuits made to eat be eaten with a fork and a knife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, we got a really good biscuit recipe I can send you if, okay. you, if you need one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lee Bryce, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Uh, right. Uh, that's funny how that just worked into there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. Uh, where am I catching you right now? I've got a barn that I kind of set up. It used to be just a big shop. And when I got when I kind of got a hold of the property, I said, "Well, I want to put a TV in here in case I want to watch a football game. And if I'm going to put a TV, I want to put a chair. Well, if I'm going to have a chair, I better put a couch. Well, if I'm going to do that, I better put a stove over there so I can cook some dip or some barbecue. If I'm going to do, and uh, so that's where I'm sitting out of right now. And I also have a studio in it, so I've, I also write and record right in this same room. So it's cool. So this is on your farm in Nashville, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. So. Tell me a little bit about that farm. One of my best friends, Dallas Davidson, he's a huge songwriter. He's written 20, 30 number ones in, in town. And he had this farm, and he was going to go back home and write from home in Georgia. And he said, man, you ought to just get my farm. And I came to it, and I said, man, I can't afford this thing. And 
But once I got here, I just felt some kind of energy. I said, no, I got to have it. So I figured out a way, got it. And then I found out all these stories. I actually realized about eight months later, after I'd been walking the property, knew every inch of it, I actually brought my band over for the end of the year kind of pig roast. And I had, you know, kind of give them a bonus and hang out with them and let's all do that. Well, my bus driver came up to me and he said, hey, man, I, this 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 farm is, I mean, it's awesome, man. Congratulations. I said, thanks, man. I love it. He said, well, I didn't know you, you bought the farm that we shot the videos for I Drive Your Truck and a woman like you on. And I went, what? Wow. It blew my mind. And I, all of a sudden, all the memories came flooding back. Because when you go shoot videos, you know, you, you go to a random place maybe and you don't really take in where you are. You're just working and you're kind of doing what you got to do. This farm and I are connected like in a lot of ways. And now my family, my boys and my little girl are, are growing up in a the way I want them to grow up. You know, like they don't talk about iPads or TVs or or nothing like that. When they're out here, they're digging holes or looking for airheads or riding on a bike or a four wheeler or something, you know, and getting in the river, the creek. And it's, it's a big part of my life right now. And, you know, hopefully I want to build a house on it at some point. So let's talk a little bit about Sumter, South Carolina. And uh, first and foremost, we got to talk about how to pronounce it. Well, it's Sumter, <laughs> but there's no P in it. People, are, people, people think it's Sump. Tur, you know, they're like, I'm like, well, it is Sumter, but it's S U M T E R. So Sumter, but we have a big air force base there, which I really didn't, you know, didn't connect with a lot, but it is a big part of the, the town It's a huge Shaw air force base. But, you know, I just grew up way out in the country and I still love to go back and my friends through high school and even past that there's still some of my best friends just don't really get to see them but like once a year so we get back at thanksgiving and go cook a whole a whole pig or cook a bunch of chickens and you know barbecue you know what i mean barbecue it's south carolina so we do it the right way <laughs> so lee was cooking a big part of your family growing up yeah a huge part the biggest part of the cooking part of my life was growing up with my grandparents and every day grandmama got up and she made a full, I mean, from scratch every single day, biscuits and eggs and bacon. And when you were at grandmama's house, granddaddy was up at three going to go milk the cows. And then my my daddy's daddy, granddaddy Bryce, all, it was all barbecue. Not only did he cook old school, like on a pit, burning your own coals and just kind of doing it the old school way, but he also upped it and started building these big grills out of big old oil tanks. But he would do all the welding, every nut, every bolt. He literally went through, you know, and figured out how big he needed every hole for the gas burners. And, like, he drilled every piece of them, and they were beautiful, you know. And he had the secret sauce, you know. So that was a big part, the barbecue and stuff like that growing up. I mean, a lot of it, you know, kind of from both sides of the family. And what about your mom's cooking? I, I heard in an interview somewhere you were talking about chicken and rice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that was my favorite. But it, it's not just rice and chicken. I mean, it's like it has a, like a, some stickiness to it and some butter and like a lot of stuff that, you know, southern. And then when daddy did it, he'd put a little sausage in it, like a little perlo. And it was more like a perlo. <laughs> so, uh Lee, in terms of holidays, I'm wondering if y'all had big family gatherings. Was that a big thing in your family? Very big. We lived on a dirt road called Bryson Road, and it started with my great-granddaddy's house, and across the dirt road, my granddaddy built a house when he got old enough and married and had all the kids and my daddy and, like, all his brothers and his two sisters. And then those brothers, when they grew up, they built right beside there. And so I grew up on this dirt road street of all my uncles and aunts and my great granddaddy and my granddaddy all in one dirt road. So we were together kind of all the time, you know, in that neighborhood. And so, yeah, we had our Christmas together, you go to dinner and this and that. And grandmama cooked the macaroni and cheese and granddaddy did a big whole hog and stuff. But then on mama's side, she had a bunch, a bunch of sisters, and then she had one brother, and they sang all the time. Like, they grew up singing together. 
gospel really? stuff. And so that was a part, big part of that. And Aunt Henry had brought the dressing and Floriana, the youngest sister, she brought these little chocolate muffins with this homemade simple custard on top of them. But it's like the tre- a treasure. Uh, and Daddy would cook a ham and Uncle Al would cook a whole pig and like you'd have barbecue there. And, and a lot of those gatherings, I mean, we still do to this day. I go home one time a year, basically, for that. So it's almost like a big family reunion. Remember those? Like every five or years, you'd have a big family reunion. But it's like that every Thanksgiving on that side of the family. I mean, it's huge. (laughs) You mentioned Aunt Henrietta, and I, I heard you mention her another time. On an interview, you were talking about her sweet potato pie. Was that something special? (laughs) Honestly, the biggest thing about Aunt Henry is she's the oldest sister. And when they were growing up, she was probably 12 or 13. And and my mama and Judy, and then they were like younger than her. And they were playing gospel songs. But Aunt Henry was the only one who played. She learned to play piano with so much soul and passion and delicacy and swagger and all of it and so she taught me very basic couple chords when I was like seven years old and I the very first time I ever sang in public I was seven and I sang for the whole church and played on the piano oh how I love Jesus that's where my love for music kind of started I mean I I loved it earlier than that I was always picking around on the piano like I just was mesmerized by being able to sit there and play pick those keys and just hear those melodies in my head. But she ha- taught me how to put it into chords and play a song. You know what I mean? But Anna Henry is the kind of the root of the music that everybody, even the sisters all kind of sit there and wait on her to play. And then they, and she'll even direct them to this day. No, no, no. Now, Lori, you're flat. Now you need to sing, get, get, you know what I mean? Like, it's so funny to watch them sing these songs because they still, they still act like sisters, like to this day. And Henry will call them out. It's funny. Well, Lee, I want to jump to Clemson for a minute. So you went to Clemson for college. You played football. And, you know, you made a pretty dramatic transition from football to music. And I just want you to talk a little bit about how that well, happened. <laughs> well, it wasn't really a transition. Um, my whole life, it was football and music. I mean, when I was 10 years old, I was writing songs. I mean seriously writing songs in my mind as a 10 year old I was very serious about what I was writing and playing and football was also a huge passion of mine because number one I mean I loved it but my daddy and I you know he played football and he was so good and he got recruited to play at Clemson but he didn't go he stayed home and had a family and so I always had this thing in me that said I'm gonna play for Clemson one day and so that kind of drove me through my you know, middle school and high school years of really putting a lot of effort into football. And that was, you know, a humongous part of my life. Could have gone to a lot of other schools with better offers and this kind of stuff. But Clemson was where I was going no matter what. But the whole time, though, you got to remember, I was writing songs. Even when I was at Clemson, I was sitting in the, instead of studying, I'd go to the stairwell where, where it sounded all crazy up and down the hallway. And I'd sit there and play guitar and write songs for hours. And it got to be where there was this thing. People would come out and they'd sit on the stairway and study while I played for hours. I mean, there were people stacked above me up floors and all the way down floors. So where they came in the afternoons when they knew I'd be out there. When I when I got hurt at football and it was kind of done and I had I, you know, I met my goal. I played at Clemson. When I got hurt, it it really felt more like a well, this is supposed to happen because now it's time for me to really do what I was kind of born to do. And so I went and visited Nashville and it was, it all just happened. I mean, it's all just kept happening. And so I, you, I know it seems like a big transition from a big burly football player to, to a guy singing love songs, but the truth is I was doing both the whole time, like since I was 10. <laughs> we'll have more with Lee Bryce after the break.
welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans and we're talking with Lee Bryce. So Lee, was that transition to Nashville tough for you? What was, what was your Nashville move like? I was still at Clemson. I had a semester to go still. There was something pulling me. So I, I basically came here for the summer and lived in a, an apartment of this other dude that I never saw. He was just gone, but they, my friend hooked me up and let me kind of stay in this guy's place for the summer. And I just knew I was supposed to be here. I was writing all summer with Doug Johnson. He was a humongous part of the beginnings of, of everything for me in Nashville. So he was able to really just give me a real perspective of what Nashville was and what the music business was and writing songs and all that. And then that, at the end of that summer, I decided, I said, well, I'm, I'm not leaving. So I just, I, I was done. I, I didn't go back ever. And my friends were like, man, you left and you just never came back. Where are you? Like you're missing class. I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you I'm in Nashville. I've been here. And so my parents came up. They helped me co-sign on a little apartment on the outskirts of Hickory Hollow, outskirts of Antioch, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville. And um, I just kind of honestly just fell into Nashville and fell in love and just worked and worked. I had this work ethic of daddy said, look, I mean, if you're going to do this, just work, you know, work. And I didn't have a backup plan. This is what I was going to do, you know, I mean, I didn't, you never know if you're going to make it as an artist or this or that, but I mean, I was writing songs and I just knew this is what I was going to do. And it it never felt scary to me to be in this town and worrying, although it was very hard and skinny times for a very, very, very long time. I still never, I just never doubted it, I guess. You know, I just always knew at some point it was going to happen and guess I'm still what you know waiting on it to happen but I think it's already already happened in some ways <laughs> <laughs> well Lee you've always been such a talented songwriter but you know one of the songs that you really broke out with big time was a song called I drive your truck which you mentioned earlier and I'm just wondering why that song spoke to you so much and why you think it resonated in such a big way I mean it resonated because it's 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 the song that it is. They just wrote it to the wall. It's it's just this magic song. In fact, the day I heard it, I was there. I was almost finished with my album at that time. I was looking maybe for like one more big, fun, tempo, rocking song, right? I went into a pitch meeting and had 10 different publishers in town all around one big round table. And we were going to go around that table three or four times and let them all play me songs. And I told them, all I need, I got the ballads, I got the love stuff, I got everything. All I need, all I want to hear is big, rocking, up-tempo, fun, party, whatever. That's what I want. <laughs> that's what I need. So that's what they did. For an hour, we sat there. And then the meeting was over, and Rusty Gaskins, who's one of the best pluggers and just best people in this town, pluggers as in a person who runs a publishing company and like pitches songs to artists from his writers, he said, man, I got this song. He said, do you, do you have time for one more? And he said, but man, this isn't a tempo. This isn't like some run. He said, but I think it's the song of the year. And I was like, well, okay. So he, play, he starts to play I Drive Your Truck. And I got through the verse. And I don't even know if I made it to the very end of the, cor- or the first chorus. And I stopped it. I said, okay, I will record this song tomorrow. It's on hold. It's yes. There's so many things that happen with that song and so many stories with that song. And even to this day, how it kind of still affects me. And I don't just mean like it was a successful song and it was great, you know, in that way. But on a daily basis, people have their own version of why that song meant so much to them. Uh, It's about this father was talking on the radio doing an interview and they were talking about um, his son, who had died in, in battle, and he had died going back, trying to go back and save his friends over and over again. And so as Connie Harrington 
was driving down the road, one of the co-writers on the song, she's listening to this interview and the, the person said, so how do you deal with the fact that your son grew up wanting to be a soldier, right? And then he goes off and like early into his career, he's gone. He's taken from you. How do you deal with that? And the father was like, you know, I honestly, I actually get in his truck and I drive around and everything is still like he left it. And I feel like I'm connected to him. And I just, I just talk to him and, and ha hang. That's where I feel like I'm still hanging out with him. We ended up tracking down the father. I wanted to find him and let him know that this song that was out on the radio that was going number one was literally about his son. And we called him one day. We found out who he was. We called the NPR. We found out what that interview, we found out his name, found out the story and got his contact and called him and let him know that, hey, this is, this is your story. This is your story. And we flew him in for the number one party and let him get up and he spoke about his son and spoke about the whole ordeal. And... I mean, really, there's even more and more stories that go along with that song that are just kind of like these serendipitous, crazy things. Like the day it went number one was like the anniversary of his death. I mean, it was just so many things happened like that. They were just breathtaking. This thing burns gas like crazy, but that's all right. People got their ways coping, oh, and I got mine. I drive your truck I roll every window down And I burn up Every back road in this town I find a field I tear it up Till all the pain's a cloud of dust Yes, sometimes I drive your truck I want to talk about your new album a little bit, which just came out last fall. It's called Hey World. And there's some wonderful songs on that album. And I want to ask you about the title song uh, in particular, which is so timely and which you recorded with a very talented black artist named Blessing Offer. And he's been blind mm -hmm. for most of his life. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me about that collaboration and, and that song and how that came to be. Yeah, I mean, uh, early in kind of when the this whole pandemic and all kind of started and everybody was really, we didn't really know what was going on and it was really kind of locked down and hardcore. Uh, I had never really done a Zoom right. Like we're Zooming right now, right? I'd never done anything like that and really would have never probably wanted to. Because, you know, writing the songs, you know, being in the room with somebody is a whole different thing, you know. But I had a, I had a date booked with a good friend of mine, Adam Wood, and, and, and Dallas Davidson. And so we decided to, to try a Zoom, to try to do it over this phone. And I just like I'm sitting here with you right now in this same spot. And uh, I just remember we were just talking and figuring out what we were going to write. And Dallas said, well, I mean, it's... I don't, I don't know about a title, but I know that this happened to me this morning and seems like it has some something in it. And he, he said that that morning, about 7 o'clock, he was watching the news and his little four-year-old son walked in and asked him, said, Daddy, can, can we turn the TV off? And Dallas was like, well, I mean, yeah, we can, but like why? Like why, why do you know, I'm, I'm watching the news. And his son said, because it's scaring me. And it, Dallas said, it just took me back. I'm like, well, heck, it's scary to see all these numbers and all this stuff and all this these questions for an adult, much less a, a four-year-old. He said, so I, I immediately turned the TV off and realized that right in that moment. So he, he said, all I got is this, hey, world, leave me alone. And I don't want to turn on the TV. Ain't nothing but bad news on. I said, well, that's what we're writing. So we got into it. And yes, it came from that moment and from what was going on. But the gist of the song, we didn't want to make it feel like it was just a part of this. Because 10 years ago and 10 years from now, there's always going to be times in people's lives where they just, 
there's just too much noise and too much stuff and too much things going on. And you just need a minute to get away from it. You need a minute to like be quiet and have a time to either yourself or to you and your, your kid that that's all you need, you know? And so we, we wanted the song to be timely, not just timely, but also timeless. And I'd always thought about having another person sing on this song with me. I didn't know who it was though. You know, I was like, I don't know who it is or why. And then Enzo, my manager, played me randomly. He goes, hey, man, I was talking to this other manager today, and he's working with this other guy, and I just thought you'd love this guy's voice and what he does. And he played me a song by this guy named Blessing Offer. And all I knew about Blessing was this voice that I was hearing. I was like, that, whoever that guy is, I want him to sing on this song with me. I had no idea at the time that he had been on whatever the voice and he had songs out. He's done other stuff. I had no idea. I didn't care. I didn't care if he had never done anything with anybody ever. I was like, this guy's singing with me on this song. And it's really special to be able to, to have two completely different walks of life, you know, kind of feeling the same way and singing the same thing on the same song. Well, Lee, would you mind just singing just a little bit of it, a verse or so? Yeah, it was like, hey, world, leave me alone. I don't want to turn on the TV. Ain't nothing but bad news on. You know, it's got this, it's got this thing. It's like, there's a lyric in this song that's like, all I need is right here, right here at home. You know, so I just want to sit back on this port swing and listen to the pines sing. Which I can remember sitting on a port swing in Camden, South Carolina, when I was like 13. And the guitar. And that's all I heard was the wind blowing through the pines and that port swing kind of creaking on the chains. And so those pictures really set. I mean, those are real pictures coming from a real moment. And those were the most peaceful, at peace, content moments of my life were things like that. And so I think all of us, if we could get to a place like that in our, you know, in our, our busy lives every now and then, I think it's probably healing in a lot of ways um, and just kind of rejuvenates you. Speaking of rejuvenation, I just want to bring it back to the farm for a second. You know, you've obviously been spending a lot of time on the farm and you shoot a lot of videos yeah, on the farm with your family. <laughs> and it almost feels like you're making a documentary of your life. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about that. You know, that's uh, true. We've even verbalized that before where it's like, like with boy, we shot out here. I had my daddy up here and my mama and and all my kids. And let's just get a little eight millimeter old school camera and run around and film each other. And I, I cooked hot dogs up there on the hill by the pond and with the dogs running around. We were fishing and we, we literally looked back and said, these kind of videos that we're going to be doing, <laughs> we got a music video out of it, but we also got like the best family footage ever, like true family footage that we'll always be able to look back on. And it's documented like a documentary, like you're talking about. For the most part, it's really fun to come out here and be able to show footage or photos that are from literally from my life and from where I spend my time so it's easy to make them feel natural because they are natural. Well, Lee, other than biscuits, have y'all been doing a lot of cooking? <laughs> yeah. I built a pit out here to cook, you know, like anything on, but like it's made kind of to cook a whole a whole hog on, you know, and like like a old pig a old school pig picking. You know, I do a lot of wild game, you know, we have dove shoots and we come out and we, you know, we do all that stuff. And uh, like today I told you I cooked some elk biscuits you know elk and egg and cheese biscuits and i made biscuits for the first time like from scratch and you know i, th I think they turned out pretty good i'm gonna find out how to make them a little fluffier but other than that i did i think i did pretty good for my first time 
I mean, we cook a lot. My wife is amazing. She came from roots of, you know, Italian food. So she can do all that from scratch. And immediately we got married and she started just trying things and she'd make something she's never made before. And and then she's really gotten healthy. And so she'll make turkey chili instead of, but it's like still she figures out a way to make it all taste so good. And she puts so much love into it that everything she makes, even if it is really, 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 really healthy, <laughs> like somehow she makes it awesome. Well, if you had to come up with a last meal right now, what, what would it be and where would you want to have it? Oh man, that's tough, but I would probably say, I'd probably say, you know, if I could get my family to come up here to this farm you know my mom and daddy and some aunts and stuff and have daddy cook the chicken and rice but more like the perlo style and then mama cook my grandmother's macaroni and cheese and maybe some really really good collard greens you know and i know there's some meat in that chicken and rice but a little bit of that my granddaddy's which is now my daddy's and mine i've been making of that barbecue that would pretty much put me over the edge maybe some butter beans that would you know <laughs> i'm good to go <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good way to go out lee <laughs> <laughs> yeah buddy it would be i promise thanks for listening to my conversation with lee bryce his latest album hey world is available wherever you get music southern living is based in birmingham alabama and this podcast was produced and edited in Nashville, Tennessee. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or telling your friends about the program. You can find us online at southernliving.com and subscribe to our print publication by searching for Southern Living at www.magazine.store. Biscuits and Jam is produced by Heather Morgan Schott, Chrissy Tiglius, and me, Sid Evans, for Southern Living. Thanks also to Ann Kane, Jim Hankey, Danielle Roth, Matt Sav, Erica Wong, and Rachel King at Pot People. We'll see you back here next week for more Biscuits and Jam. 